Assalamualaikum, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Scope here on British Muslim TV. This week, we're going to be discussing the Iran nuclear deal, as well as other foreign policy challenges for the Islamic Republic, of course. As with previous shows, continue to send your comments throughout the show, and we're going to try to get to them if we can. Watch us, of course, live on satellite, as well as on Facebook and Twitter, or later if you're watching the recording of this show. Now, as I said, of course, Iran has various foreign policy cha challenges, which we will be discussing in this show. And the top of that list is, of course, the JCPOA or the nuclear deal, which um, everyone says is close to being revived again. However, certain obstacles remain. And depending on which party you speak to, those obstacles may range from removing the terrorist listing of the IRGC or the Islamic Republic Guards Corps or other such obstacles as well, such as ballistic missiles or others. Will the U.S. and Iran be able Excuse to find me, I don't have any sound or image when it comes to that? Now, we can also, of course, talk about uh, the Mossad issue as well, and the fact that we have had tit for tat attacks between Israel and Iran as well recently. And we're going to discuss that also with our esteemed panelists who are joining us live today. We're joined by Yusuf Azizi, who is a PhD candidate in public administration, public affairs at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs. And we're also joined by Dr. Nader Habibi, who is a faculty member in the Department of Economics and the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. Yusuf and Nader, thank you both for joining us and salam to you both. We appreciate you spending part of your Tuesday with us today. Uh, Nader, let me start with you, if I may, right at the top. Um, what do you Hello. make of where... I don't have any sound or image. Am I still on? Uh, Nader, if you can hear me, um, tell me what you're, what you make of the nuclear deal this time. Uh, let me go with Yusuf, in fact, at this time. Yusuf, let me go with you. Uh, what do you make of where the nuclear deal at this point in time stands? Um, from what I've understood, of course, it's about the IRGC uh, terrorist listing. Is that what you've understood as well? Uh, salam to you, Bagar, and uh, your team. Thank you for uh, invitation. Uh, yes, as you said, there are some obstacles to revive the JCPOA. Uh, one of the most important one is that uh, the previous administration, American administration, Trump administration, uh, they decided to uh, you know, put some other label like terrorism or human rights or other thing rather than nuclear activity or nuclear program on Iranian entities and Iranian um, um, organization uh, to make it harder for uh, the next administration, which is the Biden administration, to revive the nuclear deal because the new administration, uh, Biden administration, uh, told that, okay, uh, the IRGC designation as the foreign terrorist organization by the United States, claiming by the United States, uh, is not relevant to what uh, happened and what we promised on uh, the JCPOA, which is uh, completely and totally focused on nuclear related sanction. Uh, so uh, this is uh, not just about IRGC, but other entities, uh, other um, figures, and uh, uh, other personal Iranian personnel that uh, under U.S. sanction, but uh, by other means, not a nuclear activity. So uh, this is one of the issues. But uh, still, we think that uh, the, the 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 level of guarantee that the uh, United States administration and government. Uh, should deliver to Iranians and other uh, part of the JCPOA that uh, in the future, no other US administration, uh, you know, breach the deal or cheat on the deal. Uh, it is uh, still uh, on the discussion because uh, the United States said that, okay, it is about our internal domestic law and our domestic law is, you know, above the international law. We always say that we cannot change it and the next administration could come and uh, you know, completely change the executive order of each admi previous administration because the mm. JCPOA is not a treaty and it's not passed or ratified by Senate. So each president, each future president can uh, completely change it. Another, if, if you can hear me clearly now, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this at this time. Um, do you think that that the Iranians can, if for lack of a better word, trust the Americans this time around? Should matter because basically no and the reason for this i think as mr azizi just explained is that we cannot 
the U.S. political institutions do not allow any U.S. government to offer any kind of guarantee in this context, especially in international relations. Uh, and the risks that future U.S. governments might change their minds is high. We have to, um, Iranian government has to accept that. And there is no doubt because the uh, the interest groups that are opposed to uh, some aspects of uh, <coughs> Iran's uh, agreement with the United States or Iran's foreign policy remain influential in the United States. Hmm. Uh, Yusuf, you know, there's obviously a lot of U.S. allies within the Middle East region who are very nervous about a resurgent Iran, right? And they've always been nervous about Iranian influence anyways. Um, and we've had this meeting now in Egypt between the Israeli prime minister, UAE official uh, in Egypt, as I said, and they're, one of the things that they're discussing is, in fact, the revival of the JCPOA. Uh, will US allies in the region be the bigger obstacle point, possibly? I think this time, if we put it aside, Israel, uh, the uh, Persian Gulf monarch and, you know, the states uh, around Persian Gulf, uh, the Arab state around Persian Gulf, this time they are uh, more in line with uh, United States argument. Because, you know, if you back to the argument that uh, President Obama had about the deal and also the Biden administration has about the deal, there are two more important factors, uh, you know, encourage the United States government to go through the deal and finalize the nuclear program and, you know, address this issue with Iran. Uh, one of uh, the first one is that um, they can limit the Iranian progress uh, toward uh, the, you know, the advancement of nuclear program to the level, to the breaking time, to the level that they have the enough fissile materials to make such a bomb, uh, such a bomb, and also uh, put the Iranian nuclear activity under the uh, strong and bold, uh, you know, international inspection by, ID, uh, by IAEA, by International Atomic Energy Agency. So these are the issues that the United States wants to, you know, limit Iran and put it under control, uh, the Iran nuclear activity. But the second step is, is uh, the second reason is very important. And the addressing Iran nuclear program is the first step to go with Iran and talk with Iran about the regional security, about Iran's missiles uh, issue program, about Iran's uh, behavior in the Middle East. And um, they know that because there is no international concession on that, they have first to go through the you know, nuclear activity, address that, and then talking about Iran regional activity is very easier, okay? So it is very important. This time, I think Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and other countries around the uh, and Persian Gulf, they accept this narrative, they accept this um, logic on is Israeli side. So uh, what I understand is that the, uh, the national security person on that uh, side, they yeah. agree with Biden administration and Obama administration, but the domestic politics, you know, what uh, Benjamin Netanyahu now as opposition said, what the Naftali Bennett now as a prime minister want to show a heavy, bold uh, position against Iran, this is about the domestic politics of the uh, Israel that uh, they argue they are not abiding with by any deal, and they t uh, try uh, how much they can in their power to, you know, limit their own power in the region. Another, do you, do you agree with that? Do you think that the regional powers? are on board with the U.S. at this time? Because, you know, there's a lot of nervousness. There's been a lot of nervousness on their part for a very long time when it comes to the JCPOA. Yes. Um, on some issues, they are. But there are some issues that they uh, are pressing the Biden administration. Uh, we know that one of the key remaining disagreements is about the existing sanctions on the Revolutionary Guards, the post -Iran. and. Uh, we know that Israel, for example, wants to make sure the sanctions on them are not lifted. The reason for this demand is that uh, they are worried that if the sanctions on the IRGC are lifted, then IRGC can be more proactive in the region and also in terms of uh, uh, access to economic and financial resources, it would have uh, more power and more access. Uh, and so we see that in that particular issue, uh, there is uh, even right now, significant pressure from Israelis on Biden administration. But uh, on the uh, nuclear 
program itself and containment of Iran's nuclear program, I think they are uh, very much on board with the concessions that the, a new nuclear agreement would um, demand from Iran in terms of rolling back its uranium enrichment uh, to so that there is enough the time distance between for what we call the escape time is long enough that duration. Hmm. So you have to look at item by item to see on which items they agree with Biden administration and what are their uh, demands on other issues. Indeed. And Yusuf, you know, one of the one of the other huge contemporary issues, of course, has just, you know, developed is, of course, the situation when it comes to Ukraine and how that will all possibly play out when it comes to the Iran deal, because we had Russia, which, which asked for uh, specific guarantees when it came to supporting, of course, the revival of the deal. And then on top of that, there's also concerns about energy supplies. Uh, how much of an influence, in your opinion, is that right now on the status of the deal? Uh, that's a great question. You know, um, I believe that the Biden administration and the United States, as long as they delay to, you know, revive, make some guarantee for Iran and accept Iran's condition and revive the deal, there are many international, regional and domestic politics happen that, you know, affect the uh, reviving, affect the way that uh, people negotiate, that all parties negotiated this deal. So, as you said, the Russians, Chinese, European Union, and United States, all of them want to get benefit from this. So, uh, for Iran, also the most important things is that uh, you know get the military equipment from Russia, uh, get uh, some um, um, working on nuclear peaceful activity with uh, uh, Russia about the you know the Iranian nuclear reactors. Some of them are under construction by Russia, and also some very small economic uh, opportunity that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are three main issues that uh, the Russia also now under sanction by, uh, by the Western uh, government. So they wanted to see if the deal is revived, they can uh, work together on these three aspects. And we'll, we'll discuss that right after this break. Of course, Yusuf and Nader, I'm going to ask you both to stay with us. Viewers, we're going to be back after this break. We're going to continue discussing the nuclear deal, as well as what we have not yet discussed in detail, and that is the tit-for-tat attacks between Iran and Israel on, their, uh, on each other, and be it cyberspace or conventional warfare. I'll be back right after this break. Please do stay with us. Scope and continue. Welcome back, everyone, to The Scope here on BMTV. We're continuing to discuss the Iran nuclear deal as well as other foreign policy challenges for the Islamic Republic. Now, before we went to break, Nader Yusuf was discussing how the situation in Ukraine possibly could be affecting, if at all, the nuclear deal and how that may play out. What are your thoughts about that? Because, you know, there was a time when it seemed like there may be a bit of a rift between the Russians and the Iranians, and even the Iranians had asked for clarification from the Russians about what kind of guarantees they were seeking under the JCPOA. What are your thoughts about that, about energy supplies, et cetera? Yes, I, th I think the uh, um, those uh, guarantees to some extent have been met because the United States has said that the uh, sanctions against Russia will exclude any interactions with Iran. So on that aspect of it, I think it could be resolved. Uh, what remains is how the conflict in Ukraine affects the, the role that Russia is willing to play from now on moving forward in terms of um, how it behaves in the negotiations and how proactively uh, Russia might try to resolve any uh, remaining conflicts. Another factor to keep in mind is that um, the um, reduction, any reduction in oil and natural gas exports of Russia would affect the global markets. And there is a tendency by the United States and the Europeans to sort of uh, feel an urgency for uh, reaching an agreement so that uh, Iranian output of both oil and natural gas can increase and compensate for any shortage uh, on, in uh, Russian production. So that might create an incentive for uh, more compromise uh, from the Western side in these negotiations. As far as Iran is concerned, I think Iran is uh, uh, still 
um, very committed to the, the Iranian regime, the relationship that it has developed with Russia, and uh, they'll try to um, uh, preserve that as much as possible while trying to complete these negotiations. Uh, Yusuf, let, let, me go, let me come back to Israel, if I may, for a moment, because there have been these tit-for-tat attacks, right? So there was the first allegation, um, at least in the news, about Israel attacking a drone warehouse in Kirman Shah in Iran and destroying that warehouse. And then the Iranians retaliated uh, upon a Mossad outpost in Box Kurdistan, as well as then a cyber attack as well on important Israeli sites. What do you make of that and the timing of this? Why is this occurring right now? Does this also have to do with the deal, or is this more regional realities on the ground? Yeah, I don't believe that uh, there is a direct connection between the negotiation that happened on uh, Iranian issues, Iranian nuclear issues, and the uh, you know the uh, uh, regional hegemony or regional conflict between uh, Israel and Iran. So uh, this is the last sign, uh, I believe. This is the last sign of. Uh, ever-growing tension, and by tension I mean military confrontation between Israel and Iran uh, after, since uh, the Arab Spring. Because uh, since Arab Spring, Iran has more influence and sent personnel, military personnel to Syria uh, in the back door of uh, Israel's. And also Israel's try to have more, uh, you know, um, um, relationship um, and also some apparent relationship with uh, some Gulf countries, Persian Gulf countries like UAE and Bahrain, also is more active on uh, Republic of Azerbaijan, northern part of Iran, and also in the Kurdistan of Iraq, uh, Iraq Kurdistan uh, regional government. Because, you know, it is not about the all Kurds in Iraq, but it is about the Bars and his family. They have a long history, more than five decades of uh, a strong relation uh, between Israelis and these Bars and his fam family. So, at uh, this time, because the Iranian claim that uh, there are some attacks by drones to, you know, the Kerman Shah base uh, for IRGC, it is in western part of Iran. Uh, so this time, Iran's retaliate military with the ba uh, ballistic missiles from Tabriz, they, uh, from Iranian soil, they, uh, you know, uh, targeted the, uh, the, the, the building that they claimed uh, it's about uh, related to Israel. So. Uh, I mean, this is not the last one. Uh, it should be growing, as I understand, it should be growing in the uh, next years, uh, the confrontation between these two countries. That's interesting, Nader. I, I wonder what your thoughts are about that, because you know, I was reading a report today about how the Iranians have said that they've, in fact, um, put up extra security for their own nuclear scientists. And we know that in the past years, that's also been an issue, the safety of their nuclear scientists, as a number of them have been assassinated. Even while I was on the ground in Iran, a number were assassinated while I was there as well. So, I mean, I wonder, do you think that even the Iranians realize that this, in fact, will continue? Um I think they expect it to continue, but we should realize that uh, this has not been a tit for tat uh, reciprocal relationship. Uh, Israelis have been hitting Iranian targets in Syria. They have been carrying out um, uh, assassination, targeted assassination and sabotage attacks against Iranian nuclear assets for a long time. And Iran has not been able to match those attacks um, maybe occasionally, very rare occasions, responding in a limited way for a good reason, because Iran is uh, worried about escalating these tensions into a full-scale war with Israel. They realize that in a full-scale confrontation, they do not have any advantage against Israel. But uh, I think now with the uh, latest attack, which was the first time that uh, Israel openly had carried out an attack from outside Iran's borders against a military asset, and Iran sort of had to acknowledge that. I think we are uh, reaching a new level of uh, hostility where in the future tit, might tats, tit for tats might be uh, possible, meaning that Iran is willing to respond. Now, um, See, uh, the position of Russia is important in this relationship because uh, in the past, it has been Russia that sort of tolerated Israeli attacks on Iranian targets in Syria. And so uh, I wonder if uh, 
perhaps given the new tensions in Ukraine and Iran's relations with Russia, perhaps Iran believes that uh, it can count more on Russian support or Russian uh, prevention of Israeli attacks, which sort of has uh, given Iranians more confidence to resort to these uh, responses that we are uh, observing. Uh, but of, of course, there is this always a risk of escalation that uh, cannot be predicted in how when moving forward. Another factor to keep in mind is that uh, sometimes uh, heading towards the negotiations, Israelis might uh, provoke to try to provoke tensions by carrying out one of these targeted attacks, sort of to create tensions that might uh, prevent a success, successful deal. And that's a good point, isn't it, Yusuf? Because this does sometimes, as, and the Iranians have said this as well, I believe, that a lot of these are provocation. Do you think that possibly the Iranians might sometimes go too far in their responses, considering they are very likely angering the Iraqis as well, right? Because a lot of this is unfortunately playing out on Iraqi territory. Uh, it might be uh, right, but uh, as I said uh, previously, I, I, I don't see any connection between the Iran's, um, you know, I I Iran's uh, position in the negotiation uh, with the uh, international powers and Iran seeking regional hegemony because. You know, the, the, the level of accuracy and precision of Iranian missile technology is very important uh, to Iran's strategy for regional stability and security. And, you know, it is changing the game in the Middle East, and uh, it is game changer in the Middle East. So uh, if, if you can see, sometimes Iranians try to deliver such a, a very precise technology to Syria and to uh, Lebanon, and sometimes uh, with Iraqi's militias group that related to Iran, and sometimes they try to attack uh, within their uh, souls. Uh, so to, to show that, uh, okay, uh, they are not banned in this, uh, you know, transition the global international order that every country do not respect the other border. So Iran is not limited to its border. Iran is, uh, is, is, uh, is still uh, a country that can, uh, you know, uh, secure its interests within, out of its border. So uh, it is very complicated. The, the regional security is very complicated. And every country is like Turkey, Iran, Israel, and Qatar, or other countries try to show their hands uh, and show their power because they thought that the United States sooner or later leave the uh, Middle East to, pivot to uh, pivoting to China. So they wanted to get them more benefit uh, when uh, uh, the, the previous order uh, designed by uh, United States not happen anymore in in the Middle East. Nader, you know, I'm glad I'm glad Yusuf brought up that point about the U.S. walking away from the region, right? Because that's been something that's been said a number of times of recent. And I mean, I would think that that pleases Tehran to a, a certain extent because the Iranians have said they want the region left on its own and they want to deal with the regional issues within the region. Do you think that that is possible? Can the region, in fact, resolve its own issues, especially when it comes to, of course, Iran? So we've had talks between the Saudis and the Iranians behind the scenes, even though those have now been paused recently. Um, and possibly the UAE, I was just reading recently, is looking for more talks with the Iranians as well. Is this all positive in that sense? Uh, first, I have to say that I, my knowledge of international relations is rather limited. I tend to study the region more from uh, economics and economics point of view. Um, sure. in, my, in my opinion, um, the United States might not completely leave the region and uh, sort of uh, play a hands-off policy for two reasons. First of all, uh, it is committed to Israel and security of Israel, uh, and also it is committed to the security of the small oil exporting countries in Persian Gulf as part of uh, its broader strategy of uh, new Cold War with China because China is very dependent on oil from uh, Persian Gulf. It's still dependent on Persian Gulf. So uh, in the context of this new rising tensions with China, uh, it is uh, likely that the United States will still try to maintain some presence in the, in the region, maybe at a lower scale. 
Now, uh, negotiations between Iran and its regional rivals, especially Saudi Arabia, um, they have been there have been on and off for more than four decades. It's not okay. the first Mother, time. Okay, I do apologize. I'm going to cut you off. I do apologize. Unfortunately, live TV. Unfortunately, time is getting the best of us. But I really wanted to appreciate and thank you both, sure. Mother, for your time out this this busy Tuesday. I'm sure for both of them, viewers. Thank you for watching as well. The sculpture. And TV. We're going to be back next week discussing another hot topic of international affairs here in the school. Stay tuned next week, Tuesday, at the same time.